I think the public has this this perception that fibre is brown and anything brown is seen as, as very, very dull. And But fibre, fibre can be very, very multicoloured. If you look at your fruit and vegetable section in the supermarket, all of these foods have fibre in them and they're not brown and they're not dull. I personally don't like brown flakes, but I get a, a, a lot of fibre every day by eating a, a very, very balanced and very, very diet. The reason we often, or it's believed that cereal fibres are often seen as, as more protective possibly than fruit and vegetable fibres might relate to the different types of fibre that you can get. So fibres can be seen as either uh, an insoluble or a soluble fibre. And in the case of cereal, you find you have much higher intakes of, of insoluble fibres because as you would imagine if you're buying a, a, a pepper or a, a tomato there is fibre in these foods but most of this food is actually water so you're actually getting much smaller amounts of fibre whereas things like um, wheat you know possibly back to brown flakes but wheat but not just wheat kind of oats rice when we eat them we tend to eat larger quantities so a lot of the time it's going to be a, a, surely a, a magnitude point of view but also the fibres, these insoluble fibres, our, our bacteria and our gut really like them so they do tend to ferment them very well. I think what we're seeing now within the food industry is a lot of food fortification and you'll see that on the supermarket shelves, you'll see that fibre has often been added to food. You've even got in, I don't know if it's available in the UK but you've actually got fibre water water which has had fibre added to it but but obviously breakfast cereals are often fortified with fibre, cereal bars with fibre, yogurts people don't realise that yogurts often have things like inulin added to them which is obviously a dietary fibre so we're starting to add fibre to, to a lot of foods obviously we want to be careful because we don't want to say oh well we've got this fibre fortified cake therefore it's healthy. We still need to be really careful what we add the fibre to and that that overall food might be might be seen as healthy. There's, there's also a lot of work within the food industry to produce um, higher fibre, for instance flours, that you could then use in normal baking. And these are available especially in, in the US, not available here where we seem to be a bit behind the US, but they can use these flours which will appear white, so they're not brown, they're white and the consumer likes white so you could make you could use this flour pretty much in anything that you would say not use a normal corn flour or a normal plain flour so you'd be able to fortify your own foods just with normal cooking processes and I think failing that you know supplements would be would be an option you know not necessarily the best option but an option in terms of how I've got to where I am now I think like everyone else you end up you, it's, it's, it's almost by accident rather than good planning, I would say. Uh, I, I got into nutrition without having any nutritional background, but I was very interested in, in what went on in the large bowel. I came from a, a family where we have a very, very high incidence of, of colorectal cancer. So when I went to work with John Mathers as my PhD supervisor, he had a real interest in that. And also we were investigating sort of metabolic function in patients who'd had surgery, which would encompass surgery for colorectal cancer. So I had this sort of family family interest in bowels from a very early age. Um, when I left Newcastle, I went to, to Oxford. And in Oxford, the, the, the focus was very much more metabolic, very much into lipid metabolism, very much, it was, it was within the hospital, very within a diabetes center. So I got a much more interest in how you'd link this bowel function in with type 2 diabetes and the fibre the fibre story kind of just happened out of that because fibre was something that would link the bowel to, to diabetes and where we are now with looking at things like the microbiota and things like that it's it's a case of you know you have to follow the science you have to follow the literature and I couldn't imagine sort of a few years ago that we'd be looking at gut bacteria but we are so I've no idea what we'll be doing in five years' time. You can't really, really predict it. But it is very interesting. And in terms of the future, I think there's, you know, we need to, we need to understand more about what happens in, in patients. We know a lot about diabetes prevention, but we have millions of people with diabetes, and we still have no real concrete evidence about what they should be eating, 
and whether the microbiota is of any relevance to them at all or whether it's going to turn out in the long term to be a bit of a red herring. But, but they're, they're a complex group, so I think that will probably keep us busy for probably the rest of my career.